Dizzy knows the importance of wearing a face covering in public areas to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Nobody wants that. According to new data from the CDC, and you know they know what they're talking about, it is now recommended that people wear cloth face coverings in public areas. These coverings aren't intended to protect the wearer, but may prevent the wearer from spreading the virus to others, like your grandma. This is especially important if someone is infected but does not have symptoms. Like Dizzy, you can make a face covering in a few easy steps. You don't even have to know how to sew. Remember, your best line of defense from catching or spreading COVID-19 is just to stay home. If you must go out, please wear a face covering and stay at least six feet away from others. Dizzy knows all the cool kids are practicing COVID-19 safety. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Chesapeake Weekly at home. I'm still at home here practicing those stay at home orders and social distancing and we certainly hope that you are too. But we still have a lot of information to bring you so let's get started. You just saw Dizzy, the Chesapeake Public Library mascot, who is super funny and I can't wait until everything opens back up so that you can all meet him. But he shared with us some really important guidelines that are, are now um, have come out from the governor about wearing masks when you're out in public. It's really important that we start practicing that as a way to keep others around us safe, just in case we have the virus and are not showing any symptoms. And Health Department Director Dr. Nancy Welsh tells us a little bit more about that here. Take a listen. The, the masks can be surgical masks or they can be cloth masks. And a number of people have made cloth masks, which are pretty creative and colorful, and we may have a new fashion trend, who knows. But the, the mask, I need to emphasize, prevent you from spreading the virus in the community. Just based on what I've said, many, if not most, have it. They don't know they're spreading it. The mask help prevent that from being in the community. That also helps you, not just the other people in the community, because if we have more people who use the mask, we have less virus in the community, that means there's less opportunity for you to actually catch it, because even with the cloth mask or the surgical mask, it does not prevent that virus from getting in. It's not a tight fit like the N95. That we want to reserve for the frontline responders and the healthcare persons in the hospital. But if we consciously work on having less virus in the community, then there is less opportunity for you to be exposed. As I heard um, some people say on a video, I protect you and you protect me. I think that's the most beautiful thing I've, I've heard and it's so simple and so real. And of course, another benefit to wearing masks over your face is that it might help prevent you from touching your face, which is the biggest no-no right now because your face is essentially the door into your body for the virus. Um, most of the cases are we're finding are either going in through the eye, the nose, or the mouth. That is the door to the respiratory system. So you want to not touch your face. And if wearing a mask helps that, then that's great because whatever it takes to not touch your face, super important. Now, in addition to keeping ourselves physically healthy. Mental health is a big topic right now because people are struggling, people are stressed. Maintaining our mental health is really important. So um, at one of last week's mayor's emergency response roundtables, he brought in Joe Sislovich, who works for Chesapeake Integrated Behavioral Health Care. They are still providing services. They are here for you if you need help. And he had these tips if you are feeling like your mental health is, is struggling during this time. Everybody has an emotional response to a crisis, and it's normal for people to have emotional responses. The range of them are going to change. I mean, people are going to have, um, depending on their ex life experience and, and the, their socioeconomic status and the availability of resources, they're going to react a little differently. But the range could be just about anything. I think whenever you have a natural disaster like this one is, um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is fear and anxiety. And fear and anxiety is a very common uh, reaction. The other thing is sadness. And the reason people have those kind of reactions is because they're unsure of what's going to happen. Some of the fears may be unfounded fears, you know, of contracting the disease or, you know, some I, we've had staff even say this, you know, people are always looking at us and saying we may have the, the disorder. What can we do about that? So they're going to feel helpless and they're going to uh, mistake common symptoms for 
chronic health problems. And, and the chronic health problems are going to reinterpret as part, part of COVID-19. So all those things are sort of wrapped up. Um, and just the stress from constantly monitoring. Um, coping mechanisms, I mean, there's a lot of very simple things we can do, and sometimes they're obvious, but one is stop watching TV all the time and stay off the cable news networks. I mean, um, I was home uh, on one Saturday, and I got so fed up with it, I just said, our, my cable was out yesterday for a little bit in, in the town I live in. Thank God. It was a whole different thing. My wife had actually had a conversation with me. We weren't focused on the television. So that's one good thing to do. The second thing is just to recognize that to cope um, at, at home, have healthy relationships. Recognize that you are upset. Recognize that there are concerns that you have to deal with. And deal with that constructively together. Um, make sure you take some time for yourself. When you're home with your kids all the time, if you have a spouse or a significant other, let them take care of it a little bit and you take care of yourself. Um, the biggest fighter of, of anxiety is, is to decrease things that are being unsure. So make yourself more sure of what you have. Stick with one source. Stick with your local health department for information. Stick with your locality to gather information on how you cope with the disease. Do what they tell you to do because mm -hmm. people feel out of, out of control, um, ang anxious when they're out of control. So get some control back. And of course, our kids are also sensing the stress and, and the anxiety around all of our COVID-19 responses and the changes in routine, and, and they're noticing how we're feeling about it. So we also have a few tips for you on how to help your kids cope with all of this. So number one, this is probably one of the biggest things you can do to help your child. Don't watch the news or listen to it while they are around. Even the youngest kids can pick up on the tension coming from those broadcasters, so it's really important to not watch the news while they're around. Reassure them that they're safe. Don't just assume that they know. Tell them that they are safe and that everything's going to be okay. Teach them about hand washing and social distancing. That will empower them to feel like they have, uh, they have the, the control to maintain their own health. So empower them to know how to do that. Maintain a routine. Kids, just like adults, we love routine. They really thrive off of it. So it might look different from what they're used to, but come up with a new routine and then stick to it so that they're knowing what to expect moment to moment. And finally, take care of yourself. Just like we hear every time you uh, fly in an airplane, you gotta put your own oxygen mask on before helping somebody next to you. So take care of yourself so that you can be at your best to make sure that they can get through it. Now, we're also seeing uh, a lot of impact on our bank accounts and you know, higher unemployment numbers, and that's really affecting families in our community. No one knows that better than Human Services Director Jill Baker. So she was also a part of one of the Mayor's Emergency Response Roundtables last week, and she had this to say about some of their services. Take a look. As you can imagine, um, because of the coronavirus and some citizens finding themselves um, without employment, the number of SNAP applications has dramatically increased statewide during the last three weeks. Um, normally in Chesapeake, we receive about 130 um, new applications for SNAP or food stamps. In the last two weeks, we have seen close to just under 600 new applications, um, that's more than triple um, the, the number that we are used to having. So, so as a result, um, the state is relaxing some of the guidelines, um, some of the mandates that we have to use to process applications. They're waiving the face-to-face -face, um, meetings and the phone conversations that we normally have with folks there. Um, but certainly we have all hands on deck. Um, we have pulled from other resources to just process these applications um, as quickly as possible. Um, additionally, the state has added um, an increased funding on everybody's EBT card or their SNAP card. Um, so everybody who currently has a SNAP card for the months of March and April received additional amounts um, just to make sure that our families were able to to buy food. Um, the uh, families dealing with job loss uh, due to COVID-19 um, may also qualify for a temporary cash assistance through the TANF diversionary assistance with our TANF program as well. 
Um, and all of these can be applied for online. That's a one-time cash assistance, but it could be very helpful for somebody who is struggling to pay their rent. So if you are among the lucky people to still be working, but perhaps you're working from home, that's challenging. I'm learning that now too. You have to uh, reframe the narrative of how work is every single day. So I have some tips for you. If you find yourself working from home, here are a few ways to make it a little bit easier. Set a schedule and stick to it. You might need to be flexible with what that schedule is. Just like we talked about with the kids, it might not look like what you're used to, but come up with a schedule and a routine that works for you and stick to it. Set up a home office in an area that has as few distractions as possible, like don't do it on the couch in front of the TV. <laughs> Set it up in a way that looks like your work office. So if you always have you know, a water bottle and office supplies and a specific mouse that you like to use, try and make it look as much like your actual office as you possibly can. That'll help you get into the routine. When you're done with the day, be done. That one is a tough one to follow when you're working from home and there isn't that physical barrier to keep you from constantly working. It can be a challenge. So when you're done with your day, be done, put the work away, and uh, you know have some home life as well. And finally, manage your expectations. This is hard. Everybody has a lot on their minds. Um, be open and honest with your, your supervisors and coworkers about what you're capable of and how you plan to do it. Um, and just do your best. We're all just doing our best right now. So let's move on to some of the fun stuff. So you know the Parks and Recreation Department is just, just dying to get back to normal so that they can get out there and recreate with you and um, provide all of their fun events. But they have gotten very creative. If you're not following them on Facebook, you have got to. They come out with these great videos of activities you can be doing on your own that are safe and fun. So this one I love and I'm gonna do it myself. Take a look. Hi friends, my name is Anna Elizovich. I'm a parks planner with Chesapeake Parks Recreation and Tourism. This is a photo of Oak Grove Lake Park. We will be using it to make a puzzle that we can use to have puzzle competitions with. You can find this photo in the comments below. You can download it and you can print your own and follow along. So let's get started. So for this project, we're gonna need scissors, a printer, and then obviously paper for the printer. And I recommend using cardstock instead of using computer paper. As you can see, it's a little bit see-through. This is a little thicker and it keeps its shape a little bit better. So now that we've got everything printed out and ready to go, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cut off this extra white space that we don't need. Remember, if you're not old enough to be using scissors, you can always ask an adult to help you out. All right, so now that part is done, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut out each of the puzzle pieces. We're just gonna follow along on this dark blue line. We just finished cutting our puzzle, so now it's time for our puzzle off. So, in the spirit of social distancing, we're gonna be doing this virtually. So let's call our good friend, Miss Mel. Hey Mel! Hey Anna! I just got done cutting my puzzle. Are you ready to puzzle off? Yeah! Let's see who can complete this puzzle first. Three, two, one, go! I'm dying to know who won. Anna, did you win? I love that. That's such a good idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a puzzle challenge with some of my friends. I love that idea. Um, you can find that as well as the printout that they were using at facebook.com slash Chesapeake PRT. And now if you'd rather do some outdoor activities, that's still okay. Our parks open spaces and trails are still open to the public as long as you don't gather in groups and you maintain that social distancing. So we actually went back to one of our chief park rangers who told us a little bit about fishing and how that might be a great social distancing option for you. North Orange River Park's really a great spot to fish. Uh, Lake Lisa is about four and a half acres. In season, which trout season is from November through the end of April, 
it's stocked with rainbow trout, brown trout, and sometimes brook trout that the uh, Virginia Game and Inland Fisheries brings from its hatcheries up in the northern part of the state. So you can come here. There's a really great place to bring kids to learn how to fish. We have open space on the North Edge River you can go down and fish. I have a dock down there, a floating dock you can use. You can fish from the bank. A pond over in our Molly Mitchell picnic area you can fish out of. Two small ponds in the equestrian area. Now they're really small, so they have really small fish. But it's great for little kids, cane pole, bobber, and a worm, you're right there. So the winter is optimum time to come down here. If nothing's biting on the saltwater end of things, you know, the bass have stopped biting, we're bringing hungry trout in here. You know, it does require an additional trout license if you're over the age of 16. But if, you know, you're a parent and you don't want to get your own license, you can come down here. Your child can fish. You can help them bait the hook. You can help them get the fish off. You just can't fish the rod for them. But you can be right there. Uh, our park amenities, however, are closed. I can't rent you paddle boats. I can't rent you any kayaks and things like that. that you know, we'll, we'll reopen those as soon as the whole city reopens. And you know, we, we all look forward to doing that. Uh, when we are renting our own boats, you can also bring your own personal canoe or kayak here. It just has to be human power. We don't allow any motors, whether they're electric or, or gasoline, they're not allowed in this lake or any of our lakes. We have a launch at uh, Indian Creek at the, at the uh, west end of Northwest River Park. And I have a launch at Smith Creek, which is the east end of the park. Both of those are open for small boats. You can put a boat in there with a motor. Uh, it's a dirt launch, so it is limiting as to the size of the boat, but most boaters will figure that out on their own. We have a free fishing pier at Elizabeth River Park. That's still open. Um, the city pays for the license for that, so you don't need a saltwater license to fish there. As long as you're on our pier, it's free. Um, we have fishing at Great Bridge Locks Park, Battlefield Waterways, just places you can fish, and Battlefield Park South. All those are open for fishing. If you got sea water, you can fish. Oak Grove, I almost forgot Oak Grove. We have fishing platforms there. Nice lake, it's also stocked. Uh, again, Game Inland Fishery stocks that for us, so there's getting to be a good population of bass and small sunfish and brim in there. A great place to bring your kids. Summertime, I would say for shade and stuff, I probably either fish at Northwest River Park or Oak Grove. It's kind of shady. Uh, you know, if you're looking, especially with small kids, they're going to get overheated pretty quick. That's a good place to go. Uh, you know, Elizabeth River at uh, Great Bridge Locks Park, that's all saltwater. So you can catch, you can crab there, you know, and, and catch saltwater species. So it's not all just freshwater. We ask you to separate, keep your social distance. But come on out. If you've got a group of friends meeting, just keep distant. You can still enjoy the park. And we know a very popular event that has been canceled uh, once already. The April Chesapeake Recycles Day event that was previously scheduled for this weekend was canceled. And they have also gone ahead and canceled the May event. Now, the next scheduled uh, Chesapeake Recycles Day event is not until September, so fingers crossed, we're all hoping that things will be back to normal by then. But just keep an eye on their website, cityofchesapeake.net slash Recycles Day for all the updates on that program. But the one scheduled for April and May is canceled. And before we go, a couple of reminders about how you can continue to be involved in your local government, the census. If you haven't taken the census, there is still time to do so. It's really easy. You can do it online at my2020census.gov. There's also a phone number that you can call. And if you need other uh, language options, they have plenty of those as well. So just check out my2020census.gov um, and they will be happy to help you out. It takes about 10 minutes. It's super easy. Um, and it will provide some critical funding for our community. So it's really important that everyone in Chesapeake take that. The proposed operating budget is available right now for you to review. Um, City Manager Chris Price did a video presentation, so he walked us through all the parts of the operating budget, and you can actually view all of it um, online, cityofchesapeake.net slash budget. And then we're looking for your comments. We want to hear what you think about it. Um, you can email budgetinput at cityofchesapeake.net. 
with any of your questions or comments, and we will be compiling all of that information soon. A public hearing will be held before City Council adopts the budget, and they have to do that by May 15th, so stay tuned. And we want to do, before we go, a quick note about elections. You may have heard last week Governor Ralph Northam um, requested that the General Assembly look into moving the May local elections, which we have, to November. Um, the General Assembly is expected to convene at on April 22nd, so we won't have a final say on that until that time. So until a final decision can be made by Richmond, we're still encouraging everybody to request their ballot by absentee. So everybody can vote absentee right now. All you have to do is select my disability or illness as your reason for doing so, and that covers you under COVID-19. Um, so we really encourage everybody to still do that and just, just note that we are still waiting on, we have to wait until the General Assembly convenes and that doesn't happen until April 22nd, so we won't know one way or another if the election does in fact get moved. So just to be safe, request that ballot. It's really easy to do. You can do it all online or you can call the Chesapeake Voter Registrar's Office at 277-9797. Super easy to do and we hope that you will go ahead and do that. now if the election is moved to November, just note, your ballot will be null and void. So you'll have to um, still vote in November, even if you've already sent in an absentee for May, if in fact it does get moved. So we'll continue to update you on that. That does it for this week's edition of Chesapeake Weekly at Home. Thank you so much for sticking with us and we hope you're all doing okay out there. Remember, social distancing, don't go out if you don't have to. And if you do, wear that mask. We'll see you next week. Stay safe.